just sort of reached the end of his sort of his patience, and and he was the essay was about how libraries had become de facto homeless shelters, and how librarians had become de facto social workers and first responders. And I was so moved and and, and inspired by the piece, I went back down to uh, Los Angeles Public Library, the downtown branch, where I had done the bulk of my research for Bobby, uh, a film that I had done a couple years before that. And I was, um, I was struck with how, how accurate the portrayal and, and uh, what was going on in libraries that it had, in fact, gotten worse uh, since I did my uh, research for Bobby. So I started to imagine what a movie would look like if the patrons decided not to leave on a particularly cold night. Now, this is a problem in LA because we don't have the cold, obviously, that they do in the Midwest. When I started to write the script, uh, this was 2008, we were up and running, uh, the financial crisis hit, I put it on hold, um, and, and, and went off to do another project. Well, I feel like the, the picture is probably more relevant now than had we made it 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so this has been, like I said, a very, very long journey to get me here tonight and to be able to screen the film in front of you. So thank you for being here, I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. We started in Seattle at the Midwinter uh, Conference, uh, screened for a couple thousand librarians uh, at the conference, came down to California, uh, and at San Diego, we were in, uh, we go to Austin, Fort Worth, Fort Worth. Uh, and so this, this, this uh, journey is going to continue for the next five or six weeks as we roll the film out. Uh, Ryan Dowd and I met uh, online. Uh, he uh, he has, written, has written this book called The Librarian's Guide to Homelessness. I thought, well, that's pretty interesting timing. <laughs> so, uh, so I reached out to him, and I, I got a Facebook friend request from Emilio Estevez. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was my buddy Dave, so I typed a nasty message back. I thought that was not funny. And fortunately, I didn't send it because... I got a response back that was this long and quoted Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> well, that's not Dave. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a wild journey ever since. Okay, you ready for our first question? First of all, there's a couple of them that said just thank you very much for making the movie. Really appreciate it. Why do you challenge Hollywood to think deeper and use their money and influence for greatness? Well, it took 12 years to make, so <laughs> that, that kind of says it all. Uh, this is the sort of film that, or sort of story, when you go from office to office, from studio to studio, you start saying, hey man, I'm, I've got this great idea, and it's going to take place in the library, and it deals with homelessness issues, and mental health care issues, and all, and you just see their eyes glaze over, and they, you know, and they, they usually, the meeting usually ended with, hey Amelia, can you just make another hockey movie? <laughs> I could, I could, but, I, but um, the last 20 years I've sort of got out of making the types of films that the studios want to make. It makes, it makes it a much uh, tougher road because I tend to be drawn towards more stories that are about people, stories that explore our humanity. And, and so this was one, and I was not going to let this go until it what expectation did you have about the library before you decided to make this film? You know what I didn't understand about the library was the sacredness of the space. And what I mean by that is uh, I was very fortunate to spend a lot of time at downtown LAPL uh, at the social science of, of, of religion and philosophy floor. And uh, there was a terrific uh, desk reference librarian, a supervisor, who uh, allowed me to hang out and observe and be there. But I had to respect patrons' right to privacy. And, oh, should we try this? No. We're better off. Thank you. 
so so uh, what she uh, it, what she really stressed was the patron's right to privacy, and that uh, however much research that I wanted to do, however close I wanted to get, there was still that moment where if I was here, I had to go back there. I had to step back whenever a patron would come up and ask a question. That was none of my business, and I didn't understand that it, that that space is as sacred as doctor patient and lawyer uh, uh, client. That was an enormous revelation. Uh, so I thought, I'd also throw me a connect for because I thought, <laughs> that was sort of a reference that only librarians would get, and I knew that everyone else would be like, who the hell is a connect for? <laughs> I didn't care. I knew that it was a reference specifically for this audience. And I think that, too, uh, a lot of people stop being curious. And I know as, as a child, I would look something up in the dictionary, I'd, a word that I was aware of, and I'd be there an hour because of all the places I would stop along the way. Same thing with an encyclopedia. You guys are, the, are Google before Google. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think we need to, I think we need to step back into our curiosity. I think we need to ask questions. I think we need to get back to the place where facts live, and that is, that is your profession. Your character in the, in the movie said at one point, books saved my life. Mm -hmm. Do you have an experience that, a, that produced a similar experience for you? Had a book had a meaningful impact on your life at some point in your personal experience? I'm not sure if it was a particular book. I think it was, I, um, I was very fortunate enough to, to grow up backstage at the public theater uh, in New York City as, as a boy. And I, I would say that uh, being exposed to that circus and that theater element was the moment that sort of turned me on and said, that's what I want to do for a living. That, that was the real inspiration for, uh, for me wanting to get into the into, into show business, as it were. And, and the Librarian's Guide to Homelessness changed your life. Right. Ah. <laughs> 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 yes. Yes. Your fellow actors, some of whom are your friends in the wonderful group that you put together, did they have time to, uh, to visit public libraries to do their own research to get a feel for what they were about to get into as far as their characters? So the movie came together very quickly once it did. Uh, the actors, many of whom I did not know before we worked together. Uh, uh, we shot the film in 22 days. Wow. And so Ooh. how we, the planning for it was like a jigsaw puzzle where we had Gab for four days, and we had Alec for six days, we had Taylor Schilling for three, and, it, and I had to make it look like they were all there at the same time, which was no uh, uh, easy feat. And so, uh, so for me, I, I, there were a couple of things that I, I gave them. I gave them Chip Ward's piece. Uh, there was a, a book, you may know it, it's called The Public Library. It's a photographic essay by uh, Richard Dawson. He and his son went across the country, and they photographed libraries from California, all the way to New York, all parts of between, and, and it's a, um, I think the opening uh, is by, uh, forward is by Jill Moyers, um, Alex Walker is, is talked to, uh, Luis Herrera, former uh, San Francisco librarian, Chip Ward, so it's all these essays that connect the photographs. That was, um, that was a gift to each uh, uh, cast member, because again, you know, you see this cast, you know they're working on it, you know, 10 other things at the same time, and so it was like, again, I was grateful to have them for those brief periods. So I can't answer to their how much time they spent in the library, but I did what I could to get them as much information that they could, that I could, so that they would have an understanding of what the film was, what the mission was. How was the, the song, it's gonna be a bright, bright, sunshine <laughs> So um, it was originally going to be a Journey. And it was don't stop believing. <laughs> and I thought this is this would be fun, it would be light. And about two weeks before we started shooting, uh, I got word that they said no. I said, okay, uh, why? And they said, well, we just you know we object to the nudity. And I said, but it's from the waist up. And they said, we still we still object. So I I wrote Steve Perry and Neil and I wrote the whole uh, band and I said, guys, I said this is not what you think it is. This is, a, this is a movie that's about something. And I think, you know, we're not making fun of the Journey song. And they still said no. So I didn't know what to do because, again, getting the, the rights, the licensing can take, can take months. 
So I was at a friend's house, he had Spotify or Pandora or something, and I, and I can see clearly came on. I was like, you know what? We're going to get this song. We're going to commit to the song. We'll figure out the rights later. Uh, I think we just figured it out last week. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I think we just got all the rights. Did we? Yeah, we did. Mark can tell you, it's from Universal. We just got the rights last week. So, so we, we took a shot with that one, and, and it worked. <laughs> what was the inspiration for the folks from the Great Surprise? Well, mm, look where we are. <laughs> I think it's self-evident. And, and by the way, uh, Great Surprise is going to celebrate its 80th birthday, April 14th, 1939, when it was originally uh, published in uh, Hail Caesar. Hail Caesar! Hail Caesar! <laughs> Hail Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> we, should, we should encourage a, a readathon. Yeah. And on that date, we should do like a 24-hour readathon, and and have you know people just hand off the book, just read a chapter, and hand it off. Let's get it. Let's get on. No, there's a sorrow here. That's where we are. So the next question kind of feeds into that. So your hope going forward that the movie will inspire people to do what as it pertains to the home. <clears throat> I'm hoping that what happens with the film is that we begin a dialogue that humanizes the poor, that humanizes the individuals experiencing homelessness, that humanizes mental illness, that puts a face and a name to the people that are suffering. We are, all of us, have a certain amount of trauma in our life. We do not walk the earth pain free. No one. It's just a matter of degree. So that's what interests me about this film. I think that. Let's check our bias at the door when we see someone on the street because we don't know how they got there. So let's not bring that to it. Let's say that this is a person who, who is in need. Uh, what I did for you, what I what you did for me, you did for the least among us. So we have to remember that. You know, there's not some magic rocket ship that's going to take some of those folks that we don't want to look at anymore off to another planet. They are here. So we need to, it's, it's about housing, it's about health, and you can't get healthy unless you have a roof over your head. All right. So we got to talk about housing first. We got to talk about universal housing. It's a giant idea, but we are a great and giant country when we want to be. And, and the idea, too, was that it would make your jobs easier, it would make Ryan's job, job easier when you have a movie that is a tool to show the rest of the world what you do. Because I don't think people understand. What excites me most about this movie as a tool for sparking conversations is that it does what Hollywood never gets right. When, when dealing with homelessness and, and poverty more generally, Hollywood usually either just grabs every negative stereotype and makes those people the butt of a joke, or it goes this noble poor route where the person is just perfect and has never made a bad decision, is never rude, and smells perfectly. And neither of those are real. Individuals experiencing homelessness are just like you and I. Sometimes they're sad, sometimes they're angry, sometimes they're happy, just like what was portrayed on the movie. And so that really, that really excites me that we can use that. But, he's too humble to say this, that won't happen if this doesn't get shared. We're going over the country to get this, this information out. So, so please, as soon as you get home, you know, share the handles on Facebook and Twitter and the new uh, previews coming out on, on uh, Thursday. So get that out there so that more people see this and we can really spark that conversation this country desperately needs. And we, uh, we open. <laughs> and then the, that'll be the, the, the beginning of the platform release. And with a platform, we start in 10, 20 markets. And then the next weekend we expand. Uh, we've got this terrific company not working with Universal called Greenwich Entertainment. And Greenwich uh, just had free solo out. If you've seen that uh, documentary, they just won the Academy Award on uh, Sunday night for Best Doc. So they've got a lot of they've got a lot of um, energy behind them. And I think using their cloud, Universal's cloud, and this uh, road tour, which is exactly what it is, uh, that goes it takes us all the way to New York. I think. Um, you know, again, we're putting it back in your hands. We're here. We're, you know, again, 12 years getting this thing made. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm now going to lean on you to help, uh, our, help the cause and, and, and really get this thing going. And the last one would be, as you go forward and as we go forward, what's the number one thing you want us all to take away from this to be able to talk to someone tomorrow about how these are human beings? Like every other. Well, I, 
think what I said earlier about checking your bias at the door. I think you have to. I think um, again, there there are, there are individuals who have a story about me, about how I arrived at this place. It's not true. It's, not true. <laughs> it's, uh, it's somebody's idea. So we, I think we got to get out of the way of ourselves and help ourselves. If that makes any sense. Right. Yeah, and, and then go have a conversation with somebody who doesn't look like you and, and maybe doesn't even smell like you and, and doesn't <laughs> live in the same type of uh, uh, neighborhood that you do. Because I think for me, it's you know the revolution is in the relationship. And so it, until we start building those relationships, this, this is actually possible. And, and keeping alive the, the social infrastructure that uh, that, that just brilliantly talked about in Eric Kleinenberg's new book, which is gifted to me up at Midwinter uh, Conference, and I'm just I'm halfway through it now, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really fascinating book. And I think, again, the library is the cornerstone of that social infrastructure that we all depend on, whether we know it or not. Mark, any closing words? <laughs> 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 let's, thank them, let's thank them all again.